All right, welcome back. It's still good morning. Nigeria live on the network service of the NTA. And to begin our conversation, which borders on a new basic education curriculum, let's uh, see this background report put together by Ibrahim Dan Hamidou. Nigeria's basic education system has faced numerous challenges, including an outdated curriculum, poor learning outcomes, and limited skills for the 21st century. To address these issues, the federal government has introduced a new basic education curriculum developed by the Nigerian Education Research and Development Council, NERDC. This revolutionary change aims to strengthen core subjects like English, mathematics, science, and technology, while integrating vocational skills and entrepreneurship enhancing digital literacy, and promoting critical thinking and problem solving. The new curriculum introduces competency-based learning, flexible and adaptive assessment methods, inclusive education for special needs students, and an emphasis on Nigerian history, culture, and values, and enhance global competitiveness. Successful implementation hinges on teacher training and capacity building, infrastructure upgrades, and adequate funding and resource allocation. However, challenges may arise, including limited resources, resistance to change, and ensuring inclusivity and equity. The new basic education curriculum is a crucial step towards revitalizing Nigeria's education system. To deliver deeper into its implications, opportunities, and challenges, curriculum specialists, education policymakers, and other stakeholders will join us on the program. Some of the key areas of focus in the new curriculum include core subjects like English, mathematics, science, and technology, vocational skills, entrepreneurship, digital literacy, and critical thinking inclusive education, special needs students and Nigerian history, culture and values, assessment methods, competency-based learning and flexible assessments. Tune in to gain insights from experts and explore how this new curriculum will shape the future of Nigeria's education system. Thank you, Ibrahim uh, Hamidou, for that background report. Uh, now joining us here to start the conversation on the new basic education curriculum is Dr. Philip John Hayab. Dr. Hayab is an educationist. A pleasure to welcome you to Good Morning Nigeria. Good morning, Nigerians. Thank you for having me. All right, we have also been joined by Umar Haruna Dogua, who is Commissioner uh, for Education, Kano State. Glad to see you again. Uh, honorable. Hello, good day, how are you? Thank you. Wow, uh, the voice of the Commissioner for Education, Canada State, uh, uh, sounds like a broadcaster. Now, let's see, uh, we have, uh, we also have with us, uh, joining us via Zoom, uh, Professor Terhi Maman, SEN, Honorable Minister of Education. Many thanks for joining us, uh, Honorable Minister. Thanks for having me again. Good morning. Honorable Minister, it's good that you sound so crisp and clear um, at the moment. So let's uh, get it off. What's in this new curriculum and um, what does it seek to achieve? Well, uh... are you was it a question to me? Honorable Minister, we are starting with you. Okay, okay. Well, good morning once more. Thank you very much for having me this morning. Um, as you know, not long after I became the Minister of Education, and uh, we got to work in understanding the problems of education in Nigeria. And we also know, as a matter of fact, that a lot of the problems we have, especially with the youth, have to do with education, uh, poor learning, poverty of learning, uh, 
uh, unemployment and underemployment, and um, worst of all, lack of value on education. You know, the youth, the parents, I don't see much value in the qualifications they obtain from various institutions, either at the pre-university level or at the tertiary education level. And uh, so our responsibility, and of course, we all know about the billions and millions of the youth out there uh, who are not in school. Now, we cannot go into the 21st century with this setup. And uh, of course, as you also know, uh, the president is hugely concerned about uh, the position of our youth and then having an education system which is suitable for our present day needs. It's seen as the mechanisms or pathway through which this youth can be productively engaged and empowered for themselves and as well as uh, for the good of the country. And so what we did is to x-ray the entire system. And then uh, we saw the problem as having an education system that can address uh, or that must indeed address the problems of quality in the education system, and then having an education system which is functional, which people can see what uh, fa can facilitate their being useful to themselves and the, and the society. So that's how we now developed a national skills framework, and uh, because we now saw skilling after a series of uh, consultations and conferences and engagement of experts and our own experiences, we now came up with a national skills framework to reject the, that level of education. Because as again, which is terribly important, is that barely 35% of the students who finish secondary school, uh, indeed primary from uh, who finish basic education, proceed to tertiary education. So we are left with about 65% of the population uh, not in education, not in any training, and uh, practically doing nothing, not engaging with the economy. And, and, and then, of course, some of them becoming even security concerns to the country. So that's why we all now agreed, like most countries in the world now, that we need to have an education yeah, system. Uh, that can address uh, some of these uh, concerns about quality of the education, about a functional education system where uh, students who finish from various levels of education can acquire some occupational qualifications and competencies that they can be on them uh, or by, by themselves or they can be engaged by the employers and by the industry. And so after developing the national skills framework, uh, of course, you can only implement it through uh, a curriculum. And so we, we, we got the ADC to, which is the agency of the ministry responsible for curriculum work, to put that framework into a curriculum. And uh, so that's what they did. And so for the last 10 months, 11 months, this is what we worked on. And we have adopted, uh, of course, as you have put out in the background information, the program uh, has all those uh, subjects, the general subjects, and then the specialized occupational subjects, which schools across the country, uh, both in the private sector and the public sector, are expected and indeed required to implement from January this year. And it is our expectation that uh, when we implement these programs, we should be able to get what we want. And now, uh, after, while we implement the basic education from January, we are also simultaneously working on uh, the program for secondary schools so that from September, October next year, we will have the program for secondary schools in place. Now, to get buyers, to get, sorry, stakeholders, 
necessary and relevant stakeholders to implement this program. And knowing that implementation is a, is a national project, we now set up, and of course, again, to knowing the time frame we have or we don't have, we now set up a special uh, task force, or if you want, a task team that will uh, ensure the rapid and smooth, seamless implementation of this program. Uh, and uh, after it is, is, we are going to present it to the public, um, hopefully next month, as soon as we are ready with it in the book form, which the NERDC is working on at the moment. And then we we'll put in place mechanism for uh, monitoring and evaluation and support. And then alongside with it, we will have a scheme for teacher support and development uh, to get acquainted with the, with the program, because the teachers are the drivers of the program. They are the ones who will implement it. And so they will need to retune and retrain uh, in the new program. And so, as I said, we have put in place now established a special committee chaired inter interdepartmental interagency committee uh, that will steer the implementation of the program. And this committee is chaired by the uh, Registrar of JAM, Professor Oloede, a person that we all know is a very serious minded uh, person. You can sleep with your two eyes when you have give him a uh, responsibility. So it's an interagency uh, committee. Because as you know, a number of agents of the Ministry of Federal Education involved, um, commissioners of education, the entire education of, uh, of, of the uh, states are involved. Of course, they were part of it, they are part of the NCE. And the state governments who own most of the schools together with the private sector are uh, involved. And uh, there will also be a lot of sensitization before and even after the implementation. And uh, so these are what we have put in place to secure the education system for our country. Much, uh, Professor Maman, uh, for your opening comments. Indeed, you touched on every aspect of this uh, new um, uh, curriculum. And uh, we must commend you for the effort, um, you know, that you uh, put in to ensure that uh, the education system, you know, is better than you met it. Uh, but uh, I would like you to just uh, throw uh, some light on some of the major changes to this curriculum. And I want to um, also know how you intend to get the teachers prepared. You said the takeoff for primary uh, schools is January. Uh, this is October ending. Is it that you intend to get new teachers? And then what is the plan actually about, you know, equipping the teachers? Because, I mean, all of this will not make sense. It will be beautiful on paper, but, I mean, seeing the impact on, on the pupils uh, may not be there if the teachers are not uh, qualified and properly trained, you know, uh, to, to deal with this new curriculum. Well, I mentioned that I said teachers are the driving force. They are the ones who are going to implement this. We are fully aware of this. Uh, right now, we are doing a massive uh, training of teachers through the smart schools across the country, through the digital resource center. And then even in the ministry, we have a digital platform where we are doing a lot of teachers and thousands and thousands of them have already been trained. But more specifically to be sure uh, we have the right, uh, the teachers with the right uh, skills and capacity for this. We already ha adopted a national teachers uh, uh, education uh, program, even at the last um, NCE. But we also have put in place another committee uh, which is submitting its uh, report by December. It's actually uh, you may even want to call it an international committee because we are doing that with UNESCO that has a lot of experience across the world in how to train uh, teachers, give them support, even their welfare and all that. So as soon as they are done, uh, I had already informed the president and he's very happy about that. So we will hope uh, that we will be able to adopt that. And, you know, the issue of training is not a one-off thing. 
it's an ongoing thing. It's, 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 a, it's a lifetime thing. As long as somebody is in the employment, just like any employee in uh, any service. So it's a question of working out a, an appropriate, suitable program for uh, engaging them, for training and retraining them. But again, uh, which also touches on your other question, a lot of the, the, the courses we brought in are occupational courses. They are not the typical courses you find in, a, in, in tertiary education or places where teachers are, are taught. So there's going to be an engagement with the community and industry who are operating in that area who will serve as trainers you know for some of the skills we are talking about and uh, if you look at the uh the the, the, the occupations who have taken out uh from agri to digital to uh construction industry fashion design you know, these are a lot of them. Yes, you find them in some formal education system, but some of them too, you don't find in formal education systems. So there's going to be an engagement with industry, which also addresses the other problem of industry and uh, the private sector not being involved in the education of our children. And it is expected also that uh, the skills that we have come out with at the moment are not exhaustive. Those are the only skills that we are going to put on the table or in the curriculum for, for the students. Those ones are what we may call baseline. They are just commencement programs. But we will have in place a system where schools, individuals, uh, even communities can propose particular courses in areas that are dominant where they live and uh, where they are, where children you know, to occupy a formal qualification training competences in, in them. And then when they propose, we will now develop, look at it, uh, refine it, and then uh, prepare uh, the, uh, the curriculum for it, which will now be uh, approved for the schools to run. So these are, this is, this is a very, uh, and even the NUC, the university, that's what they do. They have what is called core curriculum. The core curriculum is developed by the National University Commission and uh, about, it provides for about 60-70% of the courses which are supposed to be ta taught in the university. The balance are developed by special uh, subject teachers in the universities which the NBC will look at and, uh, and then approve. So it's the same principle we are applying for basic education and senior education level. But uh, as I can tell you, uh, Teachers are the core of this, and we are going to give them all the necessary support that they need. And then we also, as I said at the beginning, we are going to have a very strong M and E system. We'll be measuring them. Uh, we'll be measuring the achievement of uh, this uh, uh, this program in all the schools. And yes, I have seen in some of the uh, and some of, some of your clip where you talked about resistance and all that. You see, this one, there will be no resistance. Initially, people would be a bit uh, anxious about how the program will, will run. But I can tell you there will be no resistance because it is going to replace the current curriculum which schools are using. So schools don't have choice but to implement this curriculum. That is the new requirement. So it's not an, an, it's not an option. It's, it's a program that all schools must implement. Where schools have some choice is uh, the skill sets. And as I said, my own uh, position is that we want every child to finish basic education with at least two skill sets, you know, that he can engage himself with and empower himself with. It. And he can make the choice whether to pursue that skill set up to tertiary education level or strengthen himself you know, at the occupational level and move on with his life. So all these choices are all there for them and their parents. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister, for laying the background for this conversation. Now, let, let me quickly get to Honorable Dogua in Kano, uh, because the minister has said it's not up for debate. It's not a choice. It's not an option. It is what it is. How adaptable is this new curriculum, you know, considering the peculiarities of Kanu State and Kanu society? 
how adaptable is it? And what variants of the skill sets would you think uh, will be best suited to Cali? Assalamu alaikum. Well, let me begin by thanking you for having me in this uh, very important program and also thank the minister for appearing on this uh, very, very uh, important program too. You see, it's a review of curriculum that is being undertaken by the Federal Ministry of Education currently. I think it's the best thing that happened since the establishment of the Federal Ministry of Education. Um, uh, in this country, a lot of things are going not the way they are supposed to go. And I think uh, one of the things that went wrong for too long is the education system. You see, I was opportuned with the Honourable Minister to be at the Education World Forum in UK recently. And we saw and we understand how faithful, how countries are trooping to understand how Germany and Finland are operating their own system. You see, your education system has to be functional, defendable, workable, and reliable. The rate of unemployment, underemployment, insecurity in this country need for recall, for, for recap on what are we actually producing. Let me just give you a story. There was a time I was teaching in secondary school, and I saw one girl that didn't attend school. And I was asking her, why didn't you go to school? She's my neighbor, and she said, ah, so even those that went to the schools, I couldn't see anything that... Uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they can present to us that is even uh, attractive, that will attract you to the school. So this mindset has been there for too long, and there's a sincere need for us to build that mindset so at least our youth can be employed, gainfully employed, self-employed, or even government employment, but with skills that they can defend themselves. So this idea of reviewing the curriculum, to me and to our state, to our governor, is the best thing that happens to the education sector, that's one. When you come to the implementation aspect, you see, most of the thing we say is that the federal government should go an inch further and be involving us, the commissioners. I'm not saying that they're not involving us, but I'm saying that like now, if you take Kano State, we have more than 150,000 teachers in our payroll that we used to pay. So training these teachers to now understand or to now uh, come back and start that initial uh, redevelopment of that new system of, of the curriculum is a very difficult thing. We are trying, they are trying. If you take the teachers that are on the payroll of the federal government, they are not that much. So we need, we need, we need a kind of uh, incentive from the federal government. We need federal government to come into the thing, help state, so that state can also at the same time equally develop and even train and train their teachers. So at least this thing will go simultaneously. I'm happy that this thing is happening, and I'm assuring you that within no time, the Nigerian landscape of unemployment will change because people will be gainfully employed by themselves. A situation whereby somebody will read, uh, uh, graduate from university, stay at home for two, three years without, without employment is, is, is very, very disheartening. I know a boy that graduated with flying colors and came out started selling fish. Luckily enough, he's having a very good livelihood. But that mindset, that change of mindset, that's why the minister is saying that they want a situation whereby before somebody finishes from basic uh, uh, school, that is primary school, he must have at least two, two skills that he's uh, uh, keen to learn or he's concerned with a little bit. So I think it's a very good idea. It's workable. It is uh, practicable. And I think the Kano State government under the leadership of India, Abakabiru Sip, is very willing and ready to key in into that program and see that it benefits the people of Kano State. Alhamdulillah, even during this NCE meeting, uh, he, the minister was there, he uh, gave an award to Kano State for keying in into the, all the policies that were initiated by the program. So we are ready this time around to key in into the policy and we are ready to move forward. Right. Honorable Dogawa, if I get you right, uh, it looks like the teachers in Kano have not yet uh, started uh, you know, taking part in the training, which the minister talked about, because he said implementation is in January for uh, uh, the primary schools. So is it that at this point, teachers in Kano do not know about this curriculum and have not started, you know, taking part in any training whatsoever? I just want to get that clearly. 
We are doing the training, but what I'm telling you is that look at the number, the staggering number. And you just want to say, don't want to train somebody haphazardly like that. It has to be full trained because he's a teacher, he's a driving factor. So it takes time. Not only it takes time, it is, uh, it is uh, money intensive. You have to spend a lot of money on it. And it's not one thing of a one off thing. You have to do it, do it again, do it again, do it again. So we are asking for intervention from federal government so at least these teachers can be fully trained. Clarification, uh, Honorable Dogo, I just wanted uh, to be sure. Uh, let's uh, get to Niger State and find out what the picture is. Uh, Dr. Hadiza Sabe uh, Mohammed, Niger State Commissioner for Basic and Secondary Education, joins us now for the conversation. Uh, many thanks, uh, Dr. Uh, Hadiza Mohammed, for joining us. Uh, I'm sure you've been following the conversation, so I'll just hit you uh, straight. Um, with this new curriculum, uh, wh what, what do you think, you know, uh, would happen to our education system. And then, what is the position of Niger State? I, I want to know, how many teachers do you have in your payroll? Kano says uh, they have 150,000. How many teachers are in your payroll? And uh, have they started you know, the training so far? Are you ready for implementation in January? Um, good morning, Nigerians. Thank you for having me this morning. Um, thank you for the question about how many teachers we have in our payroll. I think we have over 60,000 teachers in our payroll in Niger State. The curriculum, the new curriculum is a very laudable one. And I want to congratulate uh, the Honorable Minister for the effort and uh, the progress so far in education. As an educator, of course, we are known not to be static, but to be able to, to always move ahead of uh, the time. That is by reviewing and reviewing our documents always. Um, it has long been overdue for us to have the new basic education curriculum. So that is why I'm really congratulating the Honorable Minister for the laudable effort. In Niger State, of course, we are prepared. We are more than prepared. Because I want to let you know today that it is in Niger State, we have the Niger State Teacher Professional Development Institute, where teachers are trained, where teachers go for researches where we take the young ones from the world level and train them as teachers today in Nigeria. We have tested it and it has worked. So having the new basic education curriculum is only coming at the right time to support the process we have started in the state. It's a laudable one and uh, I want to encourage the Honorable Minister to find time and uh, assign people to come and see what we are doing in Niger State. Because uh, we're a little bit ahead in terms of uh, trying to adopt new ways of correcting some of these, our long line issues in education that has to do with uh, the basic education, which is the foundation of education. And if the foundation is not well laid and strong, the, 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 the center cannot hold. So we felt that having this new basic education curriculum is just time to support the process we have started in Niger State for our young ones, grooming the young ones as teachers. Because it's not, uh, I think, uh, good enough to look at NCE as uh, the basic qualification to teach at the basic level. Knowing very well that NCE curriculum is not preparing our students to come down to teach at the basic level. I said this at the last NCE meeting we had. The NCE curriculum has been designed to support the student for higher education. But now with this new basic education curriculum, I want to actually um, ask this Honorable Minister 
to look downward to the teachers who are the driver of this uh, process in terms of training to go down back to the way we used to have it, even if it means changing the garment, no longer calling it a break two, but we can change the garment. Now we are now doing in Niger State, we are now serving our local certificate of basic certificate in education. And these children are fully prepared before even going into NCE to take NCE programs. So if we take it from the foundation, I am a grade two teacher. I cannot imagine going to NCE, taking a one semester course methodology to prepare me for methods to be used at the basic level for teaching. It's not good enough. So we have to revise back, go back to the drawing board so that the new basic curriculum in education can actually work well and uh, we get the result we are expecting. Mohammed, thank you very much for your opening remarks. Even though I'm not sure you told us um, the number of teachers on she your did. payroll, but, but 60,000. Okay, 60,000. Okay, I, I missed that. Now, let's get back here in the studio where Dr. Hayab has been listening. Well, you, you've heard the Honorable Minister, you've also got the input from Kanu and from Niger. What's your initial reaction to the new curriculum and how states can adapt much more easily? Start with thank you. I would say I would even prefer the title to be revised curriculum. This idea of new mm. sounds as if we never had this, okay. which is not. Uh, I'm not sure it's entirely correct. Um, yes, as a teacher educator, teacher in the classroom, um, one thing that has been uh, very topical in conversation is what the Honorable Minister said that what that is we needed a functional educational system that no one can take it away from him so I commend him uh, and his team but you see the problem I have with the whole process now is the speed okay. is the speed of implementation. of implementation there is no way you are going to introduce a revised curriculum as massive as what is being proposed and we don't have to have the engagement when this document has already come out the engagement should be when it is a draft when it is a draft so sometimes the problem is most times is always in the speed teacher educators that is teachers at the colleges of education need to be involved and to be involved massively because they are the factory that produce these teachers that will join the service. Now the training that we are talking about is for in service, those teachers who are already employed, mm. those teachers who have finished, who are employed. Now what happens in the pre-service where students have been prepared? So I would say that the best would have been that we have a draft, we engage in, with this draft and this draft should get to the colleges of education, faculty of education, these communities before we now critique the draft. Then, once we have critiqued the draft, then we can bring out a document that is reflective of the thinking of a cross, um, you know, a spectrum of Nigerians. And that is, should be the best. I commend the effort because our educational is dysfunctional. Uh, one of the reasons you say the education is dysfunctional, when people cross the road, you just need to see how people cross the road. People drive and little children going to school and we are adults. We don't even have the patience to wait to, you know, hold on for these children to cross the road. And the person driving might be a graduate, even a PhD holder. That is a dysfunctional educational system. If you go anywhere else in the world, when people step on the road, step their foot on the road, they are allowed. People will hold on for them to pass. Because once you drive, whether you hood at them or whatever, you are endangering them. Look at Nigerians who will leave the footpath, the footbridge, and we will cross the road under and we are speeding. And anything can happen, we could lose our lives. That is, a fun, that is an evidence that the educational system is dysfunctional. So I support the Honorable Minister and his team in the with the realization that 
on the realization that we have a dysfunctional education. But the speed at which we are going will actually scuttle. We will now end up where we were. When I was in secondary school, I did introduction to introduction to techno, uh, intro, intro technology, technology. technology. That was that was an idea mm. that the Fafo One Group, you know, the six three three four, had actually thought that by the time you finish GSS three, you could do something. I did home and home economics, even though I'm a man. Mm -hmm. I did all sort of subjects that was to prepare me so that at the end of GSS three, I could do and some do things. Some domestic stuff. At the end of the day, what has happened to this? Mm. We ought to have reviewed to find out what went wrong with that system. Then how can we improve better it, improve on it? On so it. this baseline study could have even taken us a year. And we should have this baseline study from different walks of life. So I like the, the agility, the commitment of the, his, uh, of the Honorable Minister, but I will call on him to if possible, maybe turn down the, slow, the, the, it down. slow it down so that we can get it right. Not just to do a program, call it with a name, tack it with the government, mm. and then after it's just in name calling. Mm. Let me say this. One of the problems I've had is that when I left teaching at the secondary school, I went back to secondary school and I saw the names of subjects have all changed. Social mm. studies has always been there. <laughs> and when you study social studies, it's more or less like studying the history of Nigeria, of course. The, mm -hmm. I, I discovered that the name was changed to something else. The name is changed to something else. Name changing can never it's make a country move. It is in the content, it is in the approach, and the mindset. And I like it that the Honorable Minister made mention to the question of mindset. Our real problem, to a large extent as Nigerians, is that is our mindset. Why are we revising this curriculum? When do we seek to achieve? And it should be a long-term program, so we don't even need to achieve it in the lifespan of this government. But you can lay the foundation now. So you have program, let's say, in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Then you see this new curriculum would have been part of the teaching and learning at the colleges of education before its implementation. Then you have a little, one, maybe one year, two years plus, to train teachers on this new on this revised curriculum. Mm -hmm. Then. You talk about producing these books. Right now, this is first term. Parents have paid books for the current curriculum. Mm -hmm. And then a new curriculum is implemented in January. Parents, who is going to pay for these books? The parents or the government? So as much as I applaud the effort that the federal government is making to, re to revise this curriculum, bringing in you know, new subsets of skills, which is very, very key, to us, then going back to the question of teaching history, I do believe that the speed at which we are going, uh, it's overspeeding. And you know overspeeding is dangerous. It's dangerous, of course. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hayab. Uh, the FRS needs to uh, you know, recruit you as maybe a consultant Influencer. or something. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure the Honourable Minister wants to respond to some of the comments that you have made. Indeed, very valid submissions, uh, Dr. Hayab, and I would like uh, um, uh, Professor Maman to respond. But while you respond to uh, some of the comments by Dr. Hayab, I also want to know, besides training teachers, are the materials, um, because, I mean, these courses, occupational courses you talked about and all of that, require practicals, you know? So are these um, materials or equipment that they would need to teach these skills already available. I, I, I want to know, uh, Honorable Minister. Well, thank you uh, very much. I, I agree entirely with uh, my friend about uh, slowing down or the thing being uh, too quick. Not in terms of that we are too quick, but about the time needed for people to be acquainted, to be prepared, and uh, for effective implementation of the program. We are fully aware of that. And that's why even the program itself, it took us almost one year. You know, uh, as I said, it was just about three weeks when we were sworn uh, into office by Mr. President that we commenced to work on this program, the framework, and then the skills itself. And maybe I didn't even mention, we are also developing the teacher's guides which uh, should be ready by next month uh, to be able to, you know, guide, uh, to provide the teachers with the resources and uh, the, 
uh, what they will need in the classroom you know to implement this program and then there have been series of consultations actually on various drafts of the program uh, before it went to NCE and we are not mindful of the fact that uh, of course at the commencement stage uh, the level of preparation will not be 100 percent nobody can make that claim but uh, this thing has to start at some point and you can and it would be difficult for somebody to say okay now we have reached the stage that we can say we are all ready to implement so you start alongside with it you now continue with all the other prerequisites and other preparations and that's why we are giving even january because when we do a public presentation hopefully early or said by middle of next month uh, there will be sensitization across the country through the regions the states and the commissioners of course will take up that gauntlet in the various states to get the teachers within their domain uh, sensitized on it and we are also working they're working out uh, mechanisms with the some of the development partners we are working with unesco unicef for them to support with resources and intensify the training which is already uh, ongoing and as he himself said and has been said here you know teachers development is not a one-off thing it is a lifetime thing so once you're already in the job you are expected to go through trainings on the program on method of teaching on uh, pedagogy you know how to review the one it climbing so it's, it's a very constant thing so it's uh, it's still not, it's not out of place for us to start from january and then as i said we have already put in place an m and e and support system we we'll put in place a support system that's what that special committee uh, is set up for to ensure that problems that come up along the line you know and states which uh, we, 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 which need support yeah we know quite a number of states are already doing a lot of work as uh, my friend and my colleague from Kano mentioned uh, in, in this and also Niger uh, Edo and many many Borno and many states they already doing a lot of things in teachers development and and rejigging of the education sector but we need a sector-wide program and which uh, the federal Ministry of education has a responsibility for uh, this is just what we came up with so we are quite fully aware of the challenges that will come up and obviously uh, they are things that we must overcome because i don't see any state uh throwing up its arms in the air and say look i can't have this no because we are operating a general system and the assessments down the road, the examinations, are all the assessments are going to come out of this. Uh, whether you are a student is, is, has acquired the necessary competence and qualifications, and then the employers will take. So I can see what we may call a kind of struggle and, and, and the rush by the states to really uh, prepare their students. And the skills we are talking about are very basic skills. They are not really very sophisticated skills uh, that will be provided at the tertiary level. They are very basic skills that a child, a student needs to be able to, to survive, to, to, to give some competence. And then uh, by themselves also, they will be encouraged, you know, uh, to strengthen themselves in those areas. And that's why I also mentioned earlier on uh, community engagement and industry engagement, because some of these skills are not things you are supposed to hear that you get them in the classroom you no know, you get them through people who are already out there and that's why if you go to like lagos onicha kaduna and other places uh, they have uh, where you have a very strong uh, private sector informal private sector like kaduna which we all know panteka yeah you have a college of technology they have this strong connection with uh, the, the uh the service being offered by people out there so it's a question of engaging them the schools now engaging them the schools around them engaging them to take advantage of uh, their capacities and their knowledge and their competencies and bring them to the classroom to teach uh, train uh, students they don't need training for years no on the skills 
It's not a years of uh, years of training. So, uh, so the system is a, the, 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 we have the facilities around the country. It's a question of coordinating, coordinating uh, what is available around you, and and that's why I mentioned earlier also that uh, communities and schools will be able to pinpoint and identify particular skills which obtain within their domain. And uh, so that, uh, you know, they cannot propose them to the ministry. And the ministry will propose, will do the review, the curriculum uh, through the relevant agents of the ministry, and then uh, send it back to those the schools in those areas. And so it's, uh, it's, there's no time we can say we, we are not prepared for it. No, every time we have to be ready to be able to roll it out. And they have a very strong support mechanism in place. All right. All right, Honorable Minister, you didn't quite respond to having the materials and equipment required for these practical skills. Intr Intratech, for example, in, in most public schools across the country, it doesn't um, exist yeah. because the workshops are not available. The materials to do the, pra the practicals, the trainings are not there. Home economics, of course, the same thing. So now with this uh, new basic curriculum, is that provision? You know, for the materials and equipment they would need to learn the skills, or they're going to be learning on paper? No, no, it's not going to be on paper because it will defeat the whole essence of uh, acquiring skills. It's not as papers are important for them to know <clears throat> the conceptual basis of any uh, any trade. This is what marks a properly qualified artisan, for instance, from somebody who just picked, who just picked the knowledge from the from the street. The papers are still important. But it's part of what will be supplied to the schools. We expect uh, state governments and school proprietors to be able to provide lab, laboratory for some of these things, uh, where students can go in and then get their training. And where, even if they have the labs, they can also identify within their community where there are workshops, there are labs, you know, and uh, make arrangements with their students so that they can go for, for the training. Right now at the university level, we have what we call sideways. Uh, we are students for any program I enlisted and go to, they have three months industrial experience to, uh, to industry and other places where they can have practical experiences. There are problems with that. I don't want to go into that now because I've been, I, I came from a tertiary education background. But this will be even more important at the level of the basic education where you have various occupations around the areas where the schools uh, exist. Uh, if you take saloons, for instance, you are not going to, yes, you will have some saloons in the, in the schools, but you have saloons all over the place. So it's a question of uh, hair, hair styling and the same thing with uh, agri, there are farms all over the place. and. Uh, in addition to what the school will have. You know, in the years past, we used to have demonstration farms in schools. And so we expect that schools will now go back to the drawing board and then earmark a garden for it in the areas of, uh, uh, if it's an agriculture, and, um, and then those that are climate related, uh, you know, for, for, for these things. And then digital, we all know the importance of uh, having computer labs, some systems around. But you also have around you people who repair computers, who run operations, who do lessons on computers all over the place. So it's a question of engaging them, you know. And uh, so the resources, honestly, will be there. It's people just thinking out of the box, looking at their environment, and, uh, and then engaging the environment around them. And so with this, it's a question of opening up our mind state. It's not a question of, okay, we do the textbooks and then dump it on the schools. No, it's not a textbook only based program. It is textbooks and competencies. These competencies will come from those who are in the field and those who are trained. So this is the way we are going to go. Honorable Minister, I, I think we should put this in a more practical perspective. Now, Dr. Hayab had talked about time, the timing of it, not how long teachers will be trained. Of course, training is an ongoing process, 
But when you want to begin implementation in January, this is, we're almost at the end of October, so you're talking two months. So if you had, as a primary school pupil, we had a day set aside, we call it, uh, we say we go to center, where we go to learn either carpentry, then I would make uh, with aluminum tin um, packers, and uh, the others will make kitchen stools and all of those. If you say schools will now be doing that, it means they have to set it up, maybe build, you know, an extra space or two. For agri, it may work for government schools because they have space to do agri. But for private schools today, where we have thrown away standards, where the people, you know, just build, there's no, the, the amount of space that is required for them, for children to do PE, they don't even have it. They build up everywhere. How are they going to do this in two months? If you say they should accommodate the people around them who do these things already, they have to have a conversation. They have to work it out. Will they do this in two months? I think it's more about, even though Rebudogu has said it, that because of the sheer number of teachers that they have, they will need, now need support. They will need time to implement it. So is it not something you want to rethink? I'm talking about when you want to start implementing so that it doesn't stop, start and stop and then start again. But when you take it off, if it's okay in the next six months, in the next one year, wouldn't that be better? Well, the, the committee we set up is going to look at some of these uh, implementation issues. And it's not envisaged, like any program, that uh, once you start, okay, from 1st January, the program keeps off, so everything will be placed. It's not going to be, it's not practicable, and nobody expects that to happen. But uh, as we go on, things that can be ready immediately will be ready. Things that will require a month will be, uh, you know, will, will, uh, the preparations will be made. But if you don't start, that comes with your own programs, because it will lose steam. You don't want to lose steam. You have to start somewhere, and then we address all these problems as they move on. In fact, uh, contrary to what you said, the private sector may be in a better position to address some of these problems. All right, it looks like uh, we've lost the connection with the Honorable Minister of Education. Now, we hope we'll get that rectified once we come back from this break. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. It's still good morning. Nigeria live on the network service of the NTA. And our focus this morning is on the new basic education curriculum. Our guests are still very much with us. So I just uh, head to Kanu now where we have Honorable Umar Haruna Dogowa, the Commissioner for Education, uh, you know, joining us. Uh, Honorable Commissioner, of course, uh, so much has been said by Dr. Hayab. And uh, you have heard the comments, uh, you know, uh, from the uh, Minister of Education. But I want to know your thoughts about, you know, some of the comments and uh, the concerns raised by Dr. Hayab. And I also want to find out, listening to the minister talk about how this would be implemented. He talked about if schools do not have the facilities, they would, you know, go to, um, you know, nearby uh, shops or businesses uh, and all that to get the students educated. Who bears the cost? Because, I mean, somebody who owns a business, who has machines, equipment and all of that, would not allow you bring students there, you know, time to time uh, to learn a particular skill without asking you to pay. Because, I mean, if I want to learn a skill, say, tell Ari now, and I go to a shop, I'll pay, of course, there's, yeah, there's some charges. So who, who pays? Is it that uh, parents will now have to bear extra costs? Or what's the plan of government in that direction? It's a little bit breaking. Can you repeat the question, please? Okay, so I'm talking about um, your, your reaction to some of the comments made by Dr. Hayab first, and then who bears the cost of the training of these uh, uh, pupils? Because the minister has, has made it clear, and of course we know that most schools, especially public schools, do not have the facilities to run this program. They do not have the workshops, the labs, the equipment, and all of that. And he talked about thinking outside the box, going to, um, you know, um, places where, you know, that's their, um, their trade, you know, for the students to pick up this uh, skill. Who bears the cost, knowing that this cannot be free of charge by, you know, whatever organization or, or individual that is uh, training the pupils? Uh, 
question. Uh, but before I answer that question, let me go back a little and commend the Niger State for having a uh, Teachers Professional uh, Institute uh, that they have in their state, which is a backlash of the closure of uh, teachers' colleges across the country. You see, certain times, the education landscape or the education uh, stakeholders do take decisions that sometimes don't go down well for the system, like the closure of uh, these uh, teachers' colleges that could have produced most of our uh, class training teachers. You could recall, I started from class seven in primary school, then went to for pi uh, class five in secondary school and uh, class four in, uh, in university. Then we went back to, again, we come to 6334 system. We are now into 934 system. So these ideas, these uh, policies, keep changing from time to time. And I think that's the main reason why the minister is trying to speed up the thing because it's a political error. Somebody may even come and uh, discard or disregard all that we've been doing to, to better up the education uh, landscape. And regarding the comment made by Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Philip, uh, saying that uh, there was no consultation with, uh, uh, that there should, there should be consultation with the uh, College of Education, I think there is consultation with College of Education, even if it is tangentially, because the EE, uh, the EES of NCC is fully involved in this, uh, National Commission for College of Education, which is the umbrella body controlling the, uh, the College of Education. What I want people to understand is that, if we are now complaining that we don't have this, we don't have that, we don't have that, we should also understand that employment continues, unemployment continues, underemployment continues, insecurity continues, and other countries are moving forward to develop, develop their country. So the basic need for, uh, thing for us to do is to just start. When we are starting, like the minister pointed out, it is when we are going, we'll be seeing things that will be making corrections and other things like that. What I believe is that the country is endowed with people who are willing and ready to help the system, but let the system be practical and operational. When I served uh, during my NYC in uh, the Old River State, 1991-92, uh, I could recall mother school there then were community schools. So community people are involved, people are willing. Yes, uh, technology and other things are capital intensive. We intend to do so many workshops here, I kind of said, and we understand the cost. But even at that, we're managing, we'll start. But there are some people that are ready, and will even now, when I pick this program, I'm going to a school, we are going to open a, a laboratory that was donated to us by, by MTN. So people and corporate bodies are willing and ready. And this is the way to go. This technology, this curriculum review is the way to go, because we have been taking for for too long. Our graduates, our uh, uh, youth can no longer be employed because the workforce or the, 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 the caliber of courses they study are no longer applicable in our uh, employment system. They cannot. So if you went now and read things that cannot be, like now, if somebody went and learned how to repair a phone, phone repairs, for example, which we are introducing in all our girls' schools now, if somebody can effectively repair a phone, it means that he will be any more salary than a professor. He will be any more than a professor. If you just can repair a phone, effectively, you have your shop at Wuse Market or at Kano or at Abu Lagos, or you can effectively earn more money than a professor. And you will have a very good livelihood. Your family will live well, and your children will go to a very, very good school. So what I'm saying is that, yes, it may look too fast, but the issue is we have to do this. And I could recall very well, the Honorable Commissioner was saying that she raised this issue during the, 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 the NC. Yes, we have made a lot of mistakes. She said it. And we close down all our teachers' colleges. We keep on changing the system at the go. But this is the way to go. People should understand that. We need this curriculum review that people should not be like self-employed when they pay from the schools. And the parent government, the parent government as a matter of urgency, should take it upon itself to make sure that it interacts in terms of capacity building with state so that they will know where to intervene. Because this issue is capital intensive and the money should be coming from the federal government for this training and other things. That's my take. And I think uh, with the minister that is very willing and ready and with his uh, uh, state minister that uh, we can all see the change on the, on the, on the, on the terrain now. This thing are possible, and I'm very sure if they can address the principal as uh, the president fully, he will implement this program. And the problem I think what the president is trying to run away from is the issue of political landscape. Because if you are doing one thing, 
now you leave office, somebody will come. Let me just give you an example. In Kano State, in 2015, we have a program where we went to all primary schools and pick those teachers that we think are not fully qualified to teach in primary schools. We brought them to College of Education, Kumboso, Federal College of Education, Kano, Tekakalbichi, more than 5,000 5, of them. And we started training them. But when the last administration came in, they abandoned the program, sent them back home. So, so you can see what the minister is trying to run away from. We have to do this thing as fast as possible, not forgetting that consultation should be the had seen. I think uh, these are my little observations. All right. Um, thank you very much. Let's head uh, quickly to uh, Dr. Hadiza um, Mohammed. You've listened to your Kanu counterpart. I, I don't know how ready, and we are putting it in context now, how ready is Niger to implement this new policy in January 2025? Uh, thank you for having me back. Uh, I think uh, as good and robust as the new basic curriculum is, um, like my colleague Dr. Philip said earlier on, we don't have to rush over this. It's a process that has to move gradually. Because from my understanding, we are talking about two issues now. We're talking about implementation of the basic, the new basic uh, education curriculum. And we are also talking about strengthening the skill acquisition arm in the schools. Um, in the actual sense, I think uh, we really need to sit back and look at how this could be implemented, considering our local contents. States vary, we have our different local contents. Looking at the aspect of the skill acquisition, like my state, the pronouncement was made last time and we have commenced the practicing of some of these skills in our schools. If you come to United State and go to any school on Friday, Friday has been step up for skill acquisition. No theory, theoretical work in the classroom on Fridays in United State. We are out for skill acquisition, but the constraint remains the requirements, that's the materials required for the acquisition of skills. That arm needs a lot of support, both from the state and federal government. And even the local governments will come in and support that process. Each local government will have a multi-purpose center where students can rotate school by school. You have different labs within a local government where children can go and learn certain skills. We don't let it in the hands of the federal government alone or state alone. Looking at the strength, the federal government is giving the local government arm now. The local government should be able to put down a multi-purpose uh, laboratory for schools that students can now go and start practicing different type of skills. Instead of going to the road sites and uh, trying to learn skills, our children are not safe. At the time you start moving students from the school to a roadside saloon or whatever. Rather, we encourage local government establishment of multi-purpose skill acquisition centers where students can go and do that. And for the new basic education curriculum, I still want to encourage the Honorable Minister for us to look at catching teachers young by establishing the Teacher Professional Development Institute in various states. When we get this corrected from the foundational level, then now they are moved up into the NC level, where methodology is just one semester course that is being taught within one three-year program, which is not good enough to come out and start implementing the new curriculum. Because the teachers are the driver of this course, and we need to get them well equipped and prepared 
today, if you take an NCE teacher to teach in the ECCDE arm of any school, the method of handling the ECC arm is not there. It's lacking drastically. I have gone out to so many schools and have seen what the NCE teachers are. Honestly, I am still emphasizing that we need to go back to the drawing board. If we want to get the proper implementation of the new basic education curriculum to be really, really handled by the professional teachers, we have to also work on the teachers. Training and retraining is not good enough. But by the time you catch them young and develop them like we used to have the grade two teachers, that are taught from early age and are taught methodology. We were taught principles and practice of education for five good years. We went out for teaching practice twice as little, little, little children. And that makes us very grounded. Then at NC again, we are sent out for teaching practice. It's not having the curriculum that is the issue, but the proper implementation of the new basic education curriculum that is another issue. The, the paperwork may be very beautiful, but the implementation may be having some issues because you are not getting the right people to do the implementation of the new basic uh, education curriculum. Please, let's look at that arm. And there is an arm of education that we really need to look into and ask questions about as educators. That's the National Teachers Institute, the NTI. The NTI, I want to believe, should be a regulatory body for the teaching profession and not developing centers here and there trying to certificate programs. We have the law school. We have lawyers go and train as lawyers. We have doctors going out for housemanship to train as medical doctors. The NTI should be a center where teachers can also be assigned to go and spend some time to regulate the teaching methodology, pedagogy, and whatever strategy of teaching we are talking about. I am not at peace with seeing NTI uh, establishing centers and uh, trying to certificate programs. They are given a crucial arm that they really need to regulate, which is the teaching as a profession. Please, we really need to look at these two arms. Now, the teaching profession is sectioned into two, the technical and vocational arm that needs serious support in terms of materials, in terms of equipments that need to be supported from federal, state, to local government arm. And also regulating teaching as a profession. The NTI really need to come back to the joint table and look at what is going to be their position of regulating teachers. We can't have NTI and we are having issues. We are having issues of irregularity in teaching profession. Or come to us in Niger State and we share with you the establishment of Teacher Professional Development Institute. Thank you. For the invitation, uh, Dr. Asabe Mohammed, I'm sure uh, maybe your counterpart in Kano would uh, take that invitation and, and, and of course, uh, you know, come to learn how that can be established in Kano. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, you, 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 you have, you have uh, indeed spoken well. You talked about proper implementation of this curriculum. I should talk about not being safe for children going to roadside, uh, you know, businesses, vocational, uh, vocational centers to, to, to get the skills. I mean, it has to be within the school premises, you know, where they can be monitored and of course properly trained. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that the Honorable Minister is listening and he may want to respond to that. But I'd like to get to you now, uh, Dr. Hayab. Uh, I should begin to round off this conversation. We'll talk about skills. Uh, we know that um, not every child will be interested in a particular skill. So how do you think implementation should be? Is it, should it be compulsory? Say, for example, there are three or four skill sets um, compulsory that every child picks up all the skills. Or should it be a, a, a situation whereby the child has to choose? But again, at the age where this is being introduced, do they have the ability to choose? So how would that you know, work? in terms of you know, the skills that every child gets. Uh, th that's one. Then two, you talked about content, approach, and mindset. Mm. 
how do we deal with the mindset problem, you know, in the educational system, on the part of teachers, on the part of, of, of the pupils, and even on the part of parents in all of this? Thank you uh, for those um, difficult but uh, straightforward questions. So let me start with the last. The mindset, the, for me, what I've discovered is that most of what we do is about what we can get directly from it. That is already a weak mindset. It should be about what this can bring for the good of society, even if it is not in the immediate. Now, so one of the mindsets is, I'll, this was done by me, mm -hmm. for instance, on the path of those who might be in leadership position. So even if it's going to stand or it's not going to, not going to stand, the fact that we did it and we take glory, now that is not helping anybody. Yeah. That's why you see seven presidents in our country get universities and then streets named after them. That is not the practice anywhere in the world except here. That is a mindset problem. And people who do the naming of these places in honor of whosoever, they also do it ego. for massage ego for their own gains as well. So it should, if we continue like that, we are going nowhere. For in terms of learning, most we've talked about certification here in this and the NTA. Most people go to school just to earn a certificate. Now it's beyond that. You are to earn to acquire knowledge, even if you are not employed because of that knowledge. It's the knowledge that can help you in your interaction with people in society. That is a question of mindset. So we need to work on that. Now coming back to even the point. Um, Dr. Mohammed raised in terms in of about 30 seconds, yes, please. safety. Okay, there is no way you would just go to a shop nearby. These schools don't have buses. Most of these schools don't have buses. So how, how would do you, you transport? Convey them and these them children, back? how many of them are we talking about? And how often and who pays? So there is a lot of issues that right. I will suggest that the Honorable Minister should sit back and uh, do a review. If he can do a review and push his implementation to, let's say, September next year. Now, that is going to be a fresh yeah. session, and that's, that's going to also give No, but he said the secondary uh, schools, the implementation will start in September. Yeah, but there, are, just more, the there are more children in the primary school than, than there the are in the secondary school. So this is, and this is the foundation. Oh, oh, all right. Once we miss it at this oh, oh, level. All right. You are, you are proposing September. Thank you mm. very much. Honorable Minister, just uh, in two minutes that we have left on the program, uh, if you could react uh, to some of the, you know, thoughts of um, uh, Dr. Hayab here and the commissioners in Kanu and Niger. You may also want to talk about, by the time you take off, plans for sustainability. Well, uh, I just have one sentence to, uh, by way of response to what has been said. I quite appreciate all the points. They are very great points. Uh, but what we are in is a, is a journey of a thousand miles. It's not a one kilometer journey. And as always, you have to take the first step. If you don't take the first step, you'll be stuck where you are with all the problems getting worse. All the problems raised, they will be addressed as we move over. There's no way we can say, okay, next six months, which schools now are you going to say will be ready in six months or will be ready in one year or will be ready in three months? You know? So you, you just have to commence. And you know, a lot of times policies depend on political will. We have president of a country and a whole range of governors now who realize the importance, who know the importance of education and basic education. So this is the time for us to take advantage of that political will to roll through whatever programs that we have. Instead of, okay, we set policies and wait for the next five years, three years to implement. How do we know people coming in are going to implement these programs? That's one. Two, we, we, we have resources flying all over the place they are, that are not properly channeled. All that we have to do now is to channel these resources properly. We have UB, for instance, with resources which are accessible by the states and uh, for, for the development of that level of education. So it's a question of rechanneling, and this is actually our decision now, that the resources of UB are going to rechannel into equipment and all these uh, resources that will be needed by schools 
you know, for, the, for them to, to, to quicken the process of getting schools ready. And the same instruction... All right, thank you so much, uh, Professor Terhi Maman, SEN. Because of time, we have to leave the conversation at this point. It's a continuous one, of course. And uh, once implementation starts in January, of course, we'll continue talking about it, the successes, your challenges, and all of that. And I hope then we'll have you in the studio, you know, joining us live to talk about all of this. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Minister, for joining us for this conversation. We do sincerely appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we also appreciate Honorable Umar Haruna Dogowa, Commissioner for Education, Kano State. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your comments on the program. We appreciate you. And of course, Dr. Hadiza Sabi Mohammed, Major State Commissioner for Basic and Secondary Education. We do appreciate you both. Uh, Dr. Philip John Hayab, always a pleasure to have you uh, right here in the studio and of course looking forward to more engagements thank, thank you thank you for all right me. so that's uh, good morning nigeria this tuesday thank you so much for watching remain tuned to the nta more programs ahead i'm yen ray john and i'm victor Azu. great day back on let's have it <laughs>